Well, Pastor Nichols, it's such a great honor and privilege to have you with us. Uh, welcome to our podcast, The Old Path yes. Hour. We don't do this very often, but occasionally we have a you know a proven, seasoned man of God pass through, and we like to rig fenders with him and <laughs> kind of get to know him a little bit better and sure. kind of get to know what makes him tick. Sure. And uh, such a, again, such an honor and privilege to have you with us. And uh, just got a few questions I want to ask you. And let's just start out with question number one. Let's just let's just establish our connection and kind of how we came to know one another. Oh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I have a very dear friend uh, by the name of Rob Hicks. He's an evangelist. And uh, him and I became real good friends many, many years ago. And uh, he called me uh, about you. Uh, you've been going through some, some health issues. And uh, he felt uh, I might be able to be a strength and a, and a blessing to you and just sharing some of uh, what God took me through. And uh, <clears throat> that was originally kind of how I heard your name and how uh, we started to connect. I also uh, uh, preached in uh, the church there in, uh, what's it called? Uh, Beach, Be- Park. Beach Park. Beach uh, Park, yeah, Illinois. My home church. Yeah, yeah, for uh, Pastor uh, uh, Petrick. Brian, Brian, Brian Petrick is a pastor now. Your your pastor was uh, senior, yes, uh, Petrick, but just dear Dear men of God, first time I ever heard super while I was Amen. singing. <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, dear precious men of God. And uh, it was through that that um, you and I made a connection. And, and it was a blessing being able to just try to, it's hard to go through, you know, we don't, in life, we don't ever think of ourselves as when we're men, especially, of having uh, any kind of chronic sickness or something that's just weakening us, you know. Uh, yes, sir. We're used to just kind of picking ourselves up by our bootstraps and just going on with life. and. And so it's real hard when something comes along and you're and it's bigger than you are, you know. Yes, and sir. so I, I thank the Lord for the fact that He did uh, connect us. I've really appreciated uh, getting to know you and and uh, your church here and your stand for God. It's a it's a blessing. Thank the Amen. Lord. Amen. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. Amen. And uh, really looking forward to being with you at the Super Conference. There you go. At the yeah. Super Church. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, in September, that's a highlight of my year i got three big highlights of my year (laughs) one is our camp you know we have a camp meet brother Mm -hmm. hicks will be with us he Uh preaches for us every year yep and then uh the the super conference yeah uh we go to that every year What a great name for that conference. and then uh a a bear hunt be going on a (laughs) bear hunt this uh, year so those are my three highlights uh, really looking forward to being with you there at that conference amen but uh well how about tell us a little bit about your testimony if you would preacher sure uh so uh I was raised in a in an independent fundamental Baptist preacher's home. Uh, my dad was raised in South Dakota on a farm in Oldham, South Dakota, in southeastern South Dakota. And uh, when my dad was uh, <clears throat> um, he was playing basketball for South Dakota State University, his father had a heart attack, and my dad had to go home and uh, uh, save the farm, really. And uh, so my dad. When my dad went home to take over the farm for my 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 grandpa, uh, while he was there on the farm, a preacher uh, came by the farm one day and invited my dad uh, to church. And my dad had never been to church, but the preacher had a good-looking daughter with him. And so my dad thought, well, maybe I'll start going to church. <laughs> <laughs> so for three months, my dad st- uh, sat in church. My grandpa was not a very good preacher. In fact, he filled pulpits for five different denominations. I'm not sure he even knew what he believed. Only thing, yeah, only thing we know that he did believe is he believed you could lose your salvation. So my mother was very confused in that department. But my dad, uh, <clears throat> they had a, a special speaker come through uh, named George Mensick. Uh, he was known as the uh, gangster evangelist. He was a former bodyguard to Al Capone. And uh, I'll share that testimony in church tonight. But... Um, he led my dad to Christ and, uh, my dad, uh, then got into a little Baptist church, uh, in, in a little farm town in South Dakota and he grew in the Lord, sold his farm, went to Bible college. <clears throat> I was born while my dad was going to Bible college. So when I was four years old, my dad became the pastor of the first Baptist church in Cody, Wyoming. So that's where I was raised in Cody, Wyoming. I grew up, you know, with the rodeo and horses and hunting and fishing and it's all I ever knew. And, uh, so I got saved when I was five years old. We had an evangelist come through. He preached on hell. And the next morning, I, didn't ha- I couldn't sleep that night. 
and the next morning I went to my mother and and I asked her, you know, I want to, I said, mama, I don't want to go to the fire. And I remember she took me over to, we lived in a parsonage next door to the church. She took me over to my dad's study. And I remember my dad uh, sitting at his roll top desk and, and pulling that roll top down and scooting back. And my mom said, Chuck, Stevie wants to go to heaven. And uh, I remember my dad uh, showing me the Bible. And I remember kneeling at his knee and praying, accepting Christ as my savior. It's neat. I can take you back to the exact spot. I've taken my kids back there and showed them where their daddy got saved. You know, sadly, when I was about 13 years old, the church that I grew up in went through a number of splits. My dad, when he became the pastor, he replaced a pastor that had ran off with a woman that played the church organ. The church had a lot of problems. And uh, there was th six deacons. Three of them were Masonic Lodge members. Mm. And they'd smoke their cigarettes on the front step of the church as <laughs> people would come to church. So my dad had to start taking a stand on, on that stuff, and it, the church split. They went across town and started a new church, and I grew up with a bunch of fighting people and a lot of hypocrites, um, and I began to lose respect for the, there was a There was a dearth of really strong men in our church, godly men, I should say. There were strong men as far as ranchers and all that kind of stuff, but they weren't strong spiritually. And uh, <clears throat> never saw anybody go soul winning with my dad, never saw anybody really serve the Lord. It was always women. It was never men. And uh, so when I was 13 years old, I got a job uh, just washing dishes in a, in a restaurant. I thought, hey, you know, yeah, this is great. I'll make some money. Well, there I was introduced to a lot of trashy music, uh, ungodly living. Uh, they introduced me to alcohol, tobacco. And I used to hear Brother Howe say that these lips have never touched alcohol and these lips have never touched tobacco. And I always wish I had that testimony. I should have that testimony, but it's not my testimony. And I, I got away from the Lord, graduated from high school, and um, I was offered the lead sing, singing uh, position in a band that had a contract, uh, a signed contract in Nashville. And I was so far from God at that point in my life that I thought that was God really doing me a good one, you know. And uh, it's a long testimony I won't go into here, but because of a praying mother, um, who prayed all night for me the night before I was to leave. Um, God spared me from a really stupid life, a wasted life. And I wasn't right with God, but my mother made me promise to her that I would go to Bible college for at least one semester before I would go and, and live this life that I was determined to live. So I called those men and told them that I would, uh, I'd go with them in January. And I thought, you know, hey, I'm the lead singer. What are they going to do? Well, they cussed and swore and called me every vile name that you can think of. I found out real quick that the world will just chew you up and spit you out. They don't want right. you or need right. you. Sure. And uh, suddenly, you know, I went to Bible college, didn't know God. God was like a cartoon character to me. Um, I decided to go back and finish my freshman year because I thought, well, I'll uh, take my credits and transfer them somewhere to a junior college or something. And a month into my second semester, I found out you can't transfer your Bible college credits nowhere. So I stuck at the end of my freshman year at a revival meeting. I told the Lord that I wouldn't drink any alcohol that summer. That was my big decision. Pastor's kid and really kind of a pathetic decision, but I had no idea what the ramifications of that, that decision were. And I meant it when I went home, I had, I didn't make it for a spiritual reason. I met it. I meant, I made it because I didn't want to die. I had two friends that had been killed um, from drinking and driving. And I just kind of wanted to not be that stupid, that young, you know. And so, I, so when I got home and they began to invite me to various <clears throat> parties and things, I told them I didn't drink anymore. And they yelled at me and said, oh, you got religion. And I didn't, but they thought I did. And so they didn't want anything to do with me. And so I never got rid of them. They got rid of me. And... Uh, through the influence of a man in my life that finally came to our church, was a very godly man. His name is Jerry Johnson, and he had been vested into my life. Through him, I decided to go back to Bible college and uh, still wasn't right with the Lord. Went back largely because he wanted me to. And uh, I figured, you know, I ain't got anything else to do, so I'll go back. But that year, God gave me a roommate who was a very godly young man. <clears throat> he would kneel on the floor every morning at about 5 o'clock, 5.30, with his head on my bottom bunk bed and he would pray for me and he'd say, Lord, my roommate never reads his Bible. Lord, I don't even know if he's saved, you know, <laughs> and I'd be laying there sleeping or at least he thought I was sleeping and I'd hear him and I'm like, good night, man. <laughs> and, and little, little by little, you know, God began to open my heart and, uh, 
that year, at the end of that year at the revival, I went forward and I told, I waved the white flag and I told the Lord, all right, my life is yours to control and uh, I'll stop fighting you. And I began to live for the Lord. My junior, senior year, I finished Bible college. God called me to preach. I married my wife. I married uh, Jeannie Dion. Um, her dad was Dr. Richard Dion of Fairview Baptist Church in Great Falls, Montana. He pastored that church for uh, right, at, right at 47 years. And um, he was a great man of God. Both my dad and my father-in-law, between the two of them, uh, there was uh, 110 years of pastoring. And they both passed away in, in 21. But my wife and I were called to California of all places. A gal from Montana and a guy from Wyoming. God called us to a foreign nation. Uh, called Californication <laughs> and off we went and uh, became a pastor in California so you want me to continue on that now into the rest of yes, my sir. testimony okay well <clears throat> um, you know we went out there and we started serving the Lord and God began to bless and my first uh, t day out there was uh, July 15th 1988 it was 117 degrees my first day I grew up at 6,000 feet in Cody, Wyoming, and I don't know if I was ever in a day over 85 degrees, <laughs> 117. I, my dad called me and said, hey, how you doing, son? And I said, Dad, I'm afraid if I trip, I'm going to fall straight into hell. It's so hot out here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, God, we, we began to work and uh, serve the Lord. And uh, then in, in, in 1994, I started a church called Central Valley Baptist Church in Tracy, California. And it's now in Manteca, California. And and they're, they're doing wonderfully. They have, I don't know the exact number, but I know they have hundreds that attend there now. And I know on, I know on numerous occasions, they've been over 800. I do not know what they're, I, I can't, you can check, anybody can check it out. Anyway, so God bless there. And um, I thought I was going to be there the rest of my life. I really did. But um, in the summer of 1996, um, I started to be asked to become the pastor of this church called Regency Baptist Church, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, the pastor's wife had run off with another man and uh, left her husband with three boys. Um, he, he started the church. The church was about five and a half years old. I wanted nothing to do with that. I thought, you kidding me. You know, my dad took over a church like that, and I watched what my father went through, and that's what turned me away from the ministry was all that sin sickness and, and nonsense. And I, I really didn't want that for my life. So my wife and I put a number of things in front of the Lord. I, I got to back up just a little bit. So I started the church in, in, in 94, Center Valley Baptist Church. In 95, in July 5th of 1995, I woke up uh, that morning and every joint in my body was twice its size. I was in an embryonic bent condition. Uh, my wife couldn't move anything. I was in an extremely intense pain. Um, <clears throat> I was in that condition for a month, couldn't preach. Um, and then it went away. And uh, we thought, okay, that was interesting, you know. And uh, we didn't have health insurance, so we didn't know what it was. Um, so the rest of 95, that happened, I think, one more time. And then we got into 96, and it was in 96. It happened a couple times in the summer of 96 when they started inviting me to come be their pastor. Well. Neither my wife or I wanted to go there. My wife did not want to replace a pastor's wife that had done such things. And, and I really, I don't know. I didn't want to go. I, I thought it was kind of uh, absurd after starting a church and only being there about a year and a half. And it was going great, going gung-ho. I mean, we were having great attendances, souls being saved. It was a happy place. I mean, it was just wonderful. And uh, so we put about 14 things in front of the Lord just to try to make it, make it impossible for him to do all those things. And he knocked every one of those down like dominoes, one right after the other. Finally, the fourth, 14th one went down, and I came home uh, to my wife, and I said, well, I guess we're going. And she said, well, I need one more thing. And I said, What's, what do you mean you need one more thing? We put 14 things before the Lord. And she said, well, I need my father to call me and tell me that he thinks it's his will. Well, that kind of upset me. I said, you know what? Your dad doesn't have anything to do with this. I'm your husband, you know. And we were, we were, we went into our room and we were arguing about this and I'm not kidding you, man, as a hand on a thousand King James Bibles, the phone rang and kind of disturbed our argument, you know, and I picked the phone up and normally I would say something like, this is Pastor Nichols, can I help you? And I put, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, hi, Steve, is Jeannie Beans there? That's what he always called my wife. And I said, yeah, she's right here. And I, 
put the phone out to my wife and she said, who's that? And I said, it's your dad. <laughs> and her and I had not had a conversation with her father about this whole thing. And uh, she said, hello, daddy. And he, he said, how's the next pastor's wife of the Regency Baptist Church? That's the first thing he said to her. My wife started crying. Why would you say that? And he said, because, I, you know, it's the capital city of California. And I think, you know, he had found out just a couple hours before that, he'd found out that they were interested in us. And he said, I think you ought to seriously pray because, you know, God could really use you there. Well, that settled it for us. And so up to, up to Sacramento we went, and I became the pastor of Regency Baptist Church. And, uh, you know, uh, it took a few years. There was uh, a lot of, you know, the church had been running probably about 115, 120 and it went down to, I don't know, 40 or 50. I never got any of those people back. Um, they, were, they wanted nothing to do with, with the church anymore. And uh, so then I had a lot of people that kept, kept trickling and leaving, moving out of state or whatever. They just, one man came to me and he said, Pastor, I just can't take it. I, I, I can't be here. He said, you're a good pastor, and, but he said, it's nothing against you. But he said, I, I just got to leave, you know. And so we had people like that leave. And someone would come to me and say, well, you know, the former pastor, you know, he used to do this. And, I, and I'd say, well, you know, he's not here anymore. You know, I'm, I'm here now, you know, and it just took a while, you know, probably about the fourth or fifth year we started clicking again. Back when I first came to this church, I called my dad up and I said, dad, what do I do? And he said, get their eyes on Jesus. And that's what I did. I preached the whole first year. I preached on Jesus. I just I didn't preach on a whole lot of subjects. I just talked about how good God was and how wonderful Jesus was and how we could win souls to the Lord, got them focused on the lost. And that's what we did, you know, and God just started working in a powerful way. And we were rolling along, but I kept getting sicker, kept having more and more problems and uh, uh, kept being bedridden, you know, at times I would lose the use of my legs and I'd be in a wheelchair for extended periods of time. And you still had no idea what was going No, possible. didn't know what it was. And uh, finally, in uh, the fall of 1997, um, I was diagnosed with what they called advanced Lyme's disease. And... Um, the only reason they used that term advanced is because it had, in their estimation, it had been in my body for a minimum of 15 years. So, you know, it had compromised my nervous system. When I get real bad, I look like I have Parkinson's disease and I'd snap and shake all over and, and, um, broke my neck. I've broken my neck twice. Uh, one of them, uh, broke into five pieces and, uh, they had to remove all that, you know, and put another bone From in having there. a seizure. No, that was not from a seizure. That was just from the shaking and Parkinson's disease. And um, but just shaking so bad you snapped your neck <clears throat> and snapping my head. My head, my head would sometimes snap out of control. I couldn't control it. And uh, from degenerative bone disease, and on top of it, the snapping, it it broke the vertebrae. So I had to have a neck surgery, and uh, they put uh, you know titanium in there. Two years later, it happened again, and the one above it broke into two pieces. And so they had put more t titanium on that neck surgery. So there's about six and a half inches of titanium in, in my neck. But, <clears throat> but anyway, um, you know, I just ended up for, for years, you know, being in a wheelchair, but let me, let me back up to you. That'll, uh, God began to God began to help me. Um, because when it first happened, I was just, I was, I can't explain to you how overwhelmed it was. You know, my, here I am like 32, 33 years old, you know, I've got young babies, you know, my kids are all little. New church. Mm -hmm, brand new church, a lot, just a lot of energy and gung ho. And it felt like the rug just got pulled out from under my feet. My life was altered and it wouldn't go away. I couldn't just take a shot or a pill or something and it was all fixed. It just, it just was relentless and uh, constantly in severe pain and, and, and you know, in the wheelchair, I, I've from about 1996 until today, I've probably been in a wheelchair for sure 65% of the time, maybe maybe closer to 70, but a lot of time in a wheelchair. And um, I've been through physical therapy. That's the same amount of time I've been right with the Lord. I got a share yeah, some yeah. salvation in 96. Is so. that right? Well, so. praise the Lord. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been through, I mentioned this last night in church, I've been through physical therapy four times. And what that is is where they lift you uh, with a with a crane out of your chair into the water they work you in the water three or four times a week five times a week for months and then they finally get you up on the mats they work mm -hmm. you there for months and then eventually you get to the bars and learn how to walk you know and so i've been through that four times but 
Way back in 1997, I was in a clinic, and this is where God really began to help me deal with all this. Um, I was very, very depressed, you know. Uh, I, I don't even like to admit that word because I'm not a depressing person. I, I love to laugh and tell jokes. You know, I'm a happy person, which by nature. But it had me. You know, there were days when there was nothing to smile about. There was, was, I <laughs> could already find something to laugh about, you know. And I was in this clinic in Reno, Nevada, and they were doing these intravenous treatments in me, trying to, it was a new technology trying to help me. And so I'm sitting in this chair, an easy chair, when big IV thing hooked up to me, and it takes four hours to go through this. And I had my Bible in my lap, but I wasn't reading it because I was very, I don't know, I was just discouraged. And I was probably a little bit upset at God, you know, not verbalizing it, but in my heart, I was like, what is this? You know, I'm just trying to serve you, you know? Sure. And uh, knowing my background, I thought, in all honesty, I thought, why didn't you do this to me when I wasn't living for you? You know, why now? It seemed like it was such a crippling thing, you know, and slowing down the cause of Christ that he had asked, you know, asked me to do in his will, you know. So I'm sitting there, and it must have been written all over my face because this older couple came in, and she was in a wheelchair, and her tongue was out of her mouth. It was all white and cracked, and she, couldn't, she had Lyme's disease, and she couldn't swallow. And they had a tube that went down mm -hmm. into her. And her husband picked her out of the wheelchair, and, and they, were, they were either 80 or close to, but she, she didn't weigh more. She didn't even weigh 100 pounds. She probably weighed about 70, 75. He picked her out and put her in the chair next to me. And uh, I heard this little squeaking sound, like, you know, a, a magic marker was writing on something. And he put over in my lap one of those yellow meat notebooks, you know, that the paper kind of goes over the top. And he handed me this great big, huge, fat um, marker that fit in her gnarled hand, you know. And he put it in my hand. And she had written on that, that Mead notebook. She wrote, are you a Christian? And I took that marker and I wrote yes and handed it all back to him. He handed it to her and I heard it squeaking again. And this time he handed it back to me. And that little old lady who died a month later, she had written on there, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I started crying like a little little kid, mm, and I begged God to forgive me because I had made it all about me. Sure, but I forgot that I was in a place that I wouldn't normally come and witness, and I hadn't witnessed to anybody in there because it was all about me. And God opened my eyes, son. I've got you right where I want you. And through the years, I've gotten to lead a number of health workers, nurses, and whatnot to the Lord, and I learned that you know. You can be joyful and happy in whatever whatever state you're in, oh. you know. So you had so. two people ask you. Yes, you yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah two yeah. little angels that I don't know where they came from, but God put them in, in my life. You were life. under your gourd, and the Lord <laughs> sent you a, <laughs> yes, sir. He sent yeah, you a, yeah. a worm, so, or not a worm, but sent so you a along that Along that whole journey, um, it was hardest. The, the person I think that it was the hardest on was my wife. Um, when she walked down the aisle to me and she said in sickness and in health, she never knew what that meant. I didn't either. But uh, my wife has cared for me and helped me selflessly in the background while I've been up on the platform singing and preaching behind that, that the strength that got me there was the Lord, but he used my wife. She's as smart as just about any doctor. She has researched and read and she knows just about everything there is to know how to help me. And um, she's, uh, she's been used of God to extend my ministry without any stretch of the imagination. And oftentimes people tell, tell me, they say, Brother Nichols, we're praying for you. And I always say, would you please pray for my wife? It, it's hard to be the caregiver that kind of silently in the background, nobody ever notices my wife, but I do. And I know the Lord does too. And I thank God for her very, very much because it's been a long journey. Sure. You know, and, and I, uh, I have a question. Sure. Yes. While you were going through that, starting that new church and going through those health problems, mm -hmm. did you have good men to back you up in your church to kind of help yes, you out sir. with things? Oh, and... my, yes. Okay. So when I was in, when I started the church in Tracy, I had led a man to the Lord back in 1990 who went with me to start that church. He was my assistant pastor. His name was Tim Hemingway. And uh, Tim and his dear wife, Shirley, boy, they were, they were strength upon strength. To my wife and I so while I was down Tim preached and uh, then God blessed us with some other men in a very short amount of time I had uh, some men that had already been independent Baptists that that you know they were traveling an hour hour and a half to church someplace found out there was a 
new local church with them. And so they started coming to our church and God surrounded us with some, some great people. Now, when I went to Regency, as that church grew, I can't, I, I will never be able to describe to you how wonderful a church that God gave my family and I. The number one reason that my children are serving God today is because of Regency Baptist Church and the Lord. Um, not because they had perfect parents by any stretch of the imagination. But that church stuck by me. It's still our church. That's my church. That's my home church still, my wife and I. They stuck with my family and I through thick and thin. Um, their, their attitude was, you know, Pastor, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't kick us out if we got saved. You know, we're a family. We're together. Sick, I mean, I mean, if we got sick, yeah, right. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't give up that. Say, <laughs> if you got, if we got sick, you know, and their attitude was, we're we're in this together. And they loved my children. They loved my wife. Uh, one particular year, back in 2010, I was determined that I needed to resign because that was ex- it was the worst ever, and um, it was determined that I would take a sabbatical, and I would go under the care of a doctor by the name of Dr. Cal Streeter. He was uh, Dr. House's doctor. And so we went to Indiana and twice a month, we lived down in Evansville where Faith Music is located. And uh, they helped us with a home there. Brother Ed Russ is my dear friend. And um, the church let us stay in a home and just had my church pay the utilities. And uh, twice a month, my wife would drive me up to see Dr. Streeter in Shipshawana, which is in Northern Indiana. And, uh, he uh, helped incredibly and uh, couldn't, couldn't cure it, but he taught us a lot about how to keep my immune system strong and try to, to get above it to where, you know, I could function. And uh, we were there just about 11 months and then went back home and um, went home, you know. And, and church I, is still paying you the whole time? Yes, yeah, they, they took care of my family and I. Yeah. And, uh, and so we go. We go back home and I asked the Lord to give me five years because I knew that I wasn't going to last forever being able to be that day to day pastor. Um, but God gave me nine years, you know, and, uh, what's really sweet about it. There's so many sweet things about it. I, I could brag on our church forever, but, um, I had been home for two months, month and a half. And one night in the middle of the night, I had a seizure. I'd never had a seizure before. And when I woke up the next morning, I didn't know who my wife was or my kids. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know I was a pastor. This was after you got back from That was Indiana? after I came back. I was out of the wheelchair, you know, it was just, it just came out of left field because I was doing better than I'd been in a long time. But all of a sudden I had the seizure, lost my memory. And uh, after about a day and a half, I knew who my family was. But then, you know, it took eight days and uh, Dr. Streeter had my, my wife get me down at the piano with my guitar in my hand, music, because he said, you know, music has order and it'll help him start to try to hopefully, you know, and he, and he told my wife certain things for me to, to get for her to give me and various things, uh, nutritionally and things. And after about eight days, I got my memory back. Well, that happened several more times. I had, you know, days, you know, eight to 10 days episodes. And then it went from episodes of 21 days and 24 days. And so you know, I knew it was serious. I knew I had to get aggressive about passing the baton on to the next pastor. And so I had worked with a man for years. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to mention his name on here. Uh, but he, he, he's a son to me. He knows who he is and he hears my voice. And so does everybody in my church, but, uh, he was going to take my place, you know, and we worked together for years and he was, probably one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known in my life. And uh, God used him in such a powerful way. And uh, the last two years we were co-pastors and the last six months or so he was running the church. And uh, five days before he was to be the pastor, his wife ran off with another man. And uh, it's like someone threw a grenade in the center of our church, you know, we didn't lose any families over it, but it just hurt, you know, it hurt really bad. We didn't know what to do. And, uh, so him and I talked and he'd always been my right hand man. He, he's the one that besides my wife that really extended my ministry because he helped me. One of the things Lyme disease does is what they have, what's called the Lyme fog. And, uh, I got to the place where I couldn't, couldn't plan events. I couldn't do all the details. You know, my mind would get all, all fogged and I, and so he helped me 
he became like my administrative man, you know, and he helped me administrate the, the ministry. So after this happened, uh, he, we decided that he'd just go right back to these old ways and we just keep going on together. And now I'm the pastor again. And, uh, only problem was, is that three months later I had a, had a seizure and I lost my memory for 60 days. Every, they thought it was permanent. You know, everybody did. So when I came to, he came to me and he said, you know, we've talked about this before pastor and, and you know that you're not going to be able to pastor. Well, I knew that too. And he said, so I can't be here. I have to leave. The, the new pastor has to come in and not have me here because I've, I've been the pastor, you know, and broke both of our hearts. We cried, <laughs> but, uh, he went on for God. And by the way, he just sent me a text the other day, pastor, I just led my barber to Christ and his wife to Christ and all their kids to Christ. And they're getting baptized on Sunday. <laughs> and he sent me pictures of all of them. And so he went on for God. He's, I've seen so many before just quit on God, you know, when they go through trials, not him. He went on for God. Good. He's a great man of God. And I love him. Like, my fifth son, you know, he's just precious to me. And, uh, was he filling in for you while oh, you were yeah, there? Was, there, was, there was 14 men that preached while I was gone that year. And, uh, they preached the pulpit. Sometimes they'd get up and they'd say, pastor can't be here tonight. So I'm just going to carry the water for him. And I'll tell you what, we're Baptists. You know, they go <laughs> <laughs> preach their heart out. You just you know. rotate it. Cycle yep, through. Yep. We had a, I, we, we scheduled it all out. They all knew when they were going to preach and they just, uh, and you know, our church, I came home to a church with people in it that I didn't know. And the buses rolled every week. The salt winning went every week. It just went on. You know, it's an incredible yeah, testimony man. to Auto the world. Pilot. Yeah, it was incredible. That's the way it ought to be. Yes, you, sir. We serve up. God, not the pastor, you know. And they went on yeah. and served God, and I'm very proud of them. So anyways, when all that happened, I had to determine and pray, you know, God, what are we going to do now? And so uh, back in 1990, I led a man to Christ, and uh, pretty sure that... His wife was six months pregnant with a little boy. I'm pretty sure that's the timing of it, or I could be wrong. But anyway, all these years later, that little boy married my daughter. And uh, he graduated from Bible College, and I had helped him uh, become a pastor of a church about nine miles from our church. And so I ended up praying about it for several weeks, and then I talked to him, and um, it was a wonderful thing. He, I sat him down, and I said, listen, uh, he's my son-in-law. His name's Stephen Becker. And I said, Stephen, I think God wants you to possibly be the pastor of Regency. And, you know, he just, he, he wept because years before when I had my first seizure, the Lord laid on his heart, you know, and he was just, I think at that time he was like a freshman or sophomore in Bible college. And the Lord had laid on his heart that maybe someday he might end up pastoring his, his home church. Well, then I went with this other man. And uh, so he was like, okay, no problem. And then he became the pastor of this church and he thought, okay, well, now we see God's will, you know. But then as soon as I had that 60 day one, God smacked him in the heart again. And, but he had promised he'd never tell his wife, never tell a living soul or even me until I talked to him. So when I talked to him, he, he just wept because he, 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 he was all prayed up on it <laughs> and he knew it was God's will. And I knew it was God's will. And as soon as I presented it to our people, they knew it was God's will. And, uh, so on the first Sunday of January, 2019, we had a big old, uh, pass the baton Sunday. And I passed the baton to him, and we merged our two churches together. We moved our properties over to, to their property. It was a better property. But um, I tell people he's doing so good, it ticks me off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the church has gone on fantastically. My oldest son is the youth pastor, runs our Christian school. My next son down is assistant pastor. My daughter's married to the pastor, and my next daughter is married to the bus director. So they're all serving together. And uh, so we sing together, record music together, and God's blessed me with 13 grandkids and two more on the way. So oh, praise God. I'm living the dream. Amen. Well, preacher, just being around you the last few days, you know, you're getting around pretty good. Yes, and, sir. Yes, sir. And cognitively, you yep. know, I can't imagine yep. you being any more wittier or yes, sharper sir. or anything. Praise I mean, God. You seem like you're doing great. <laughs> I can what, tell you what, a funny what, story. What is it that's, uh, can you give us some nutritional <laughs> products recommendation? I mean, what is it that's... His name, is, his name is Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story. When I came back from that uh, 60 day one, there's a, there's a, uh, my, my, my son-in-law, Stephen, he has a cousin that's a member in our church and uh, his name's Eric and Eric, I've known Eric since he was five years old, you know, and, uh, Eric's, there's probably never been a more loyal church member in my life than, than Eric Weber. 
who's real close friends with Brother Hicks, by the way. <laughs> and uh, he, has, he, has, he has several kids, but he has a little boy named Bryson. And uh, in the past, you know, we didn't let everybody know all the time what, what Pastor was going through. But when those big ones happened, the, the church knew everybody was praying for me and so forth. So I come to church, and little Bryson saw me. I hadn't been around people for the longest time. And I come to church, and Bryson says, Pastor, did you, did you get your memory back? I've been praying for you. I said, man, Jack, thanks so much for praying for me. Jack, I tell you. He looked up at me, and he's like, I'm Bryson, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just uh, kidding you, Bryson. I know who you are. Uh, but, you know, the Lord, it's, it's all because of the Lord, you know. I, I, I can't tell you, you know, I, we definitely, you know, Dr. Streeter was a huge help. One of the things he taught us about Lyme's disease is that you have to keep tricking it. It's a very intelligent bacteria, and you have to. I mean, it's strictly tick-borne, is that correct? Yeah, well, I don't know. That'll be a debate till we get to heaven. <laughs> I think the United States military had something to do with it personally. <laughs> now they it think I'm a wacko, but it whatever. There, there's some nonsense going on in this world. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But yes, the, the going line is that it's a tick-borne virus. Although no ticks in human history before that ever carried anything to all of the people that they bit. You know, right. Suddenly they carried this insane virus, you know. Well, see, but that's you what my doctor to, told me. I thought I had limes, And she said, okay, well, there was no limes prior to, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's... It's a whole big conversation. Anyways, um, the thing that Dr. Streeter taught us is that, you know, every three months you have to switch whatever you're trying to fight it with because it'll just, it'll like start like eating it. It'll start like destroying it. So you have to switch. You have to keep confusing it. Um, there's a doctor out in Wisconsin now that believes that he can kill Lyme's disease, but I don't know, you know. Uh, it's never been accomplished in me. Um, I've had to deal with it all these years and, um, but I, I've learned, we've learned to just, you know, I'm, I constantly take products that help me keep my immune system up and, uh, and God has helped me very much. And I, I've, the only part that I struggle as far as say memory loss, I've lost some of the scripture memory that I had. Um, my wife, uh, is very good at the sequence of events and what year it was and what month it was and all that kind of stuff. And I think all women are sort of like that, but I, I, I can't remember. I, I get mixed up sometimes with when and where and what and who, and she always straightens me out on that. So, but, uh, but, but in all honesty, uh, God has been, I, I can't praise God enough for how he's got me through. Like even right now, I just had full knee re replacement and, um, you know, I've been a diabetic for 22 years. And uh, so I'm healing slow, but I'm doing really good. And the surgeon said I'm healing really, you know, really right. Everything's just right. And so I don't have any complaints. Amen. God's been more good to me than anything else. So, <laughs> Amen. That was good. Well, preacher, uh, you know, this last year, was one of the hardest years of my life. And I was in a massive yes. ulcerative colitis flare up. And I was uh, struggling for five months. Uh, mm. super bad flare and I was to, it was the point where I was thinking maybe it's time for me to get out of ministry mm -hmm. and then we spoke and uh, you know you were great encouragement to me on the phone and uh, you know kind of you know made me feel bad I'm <laughs> like good night if he can go through what he I mean what the thing that stood out in my mind was you snapping your neck because you were shaking so bad mm -hmm. and I said good night if he can continue to pastor and keep going with that. I mean, you made me feel pretty, pretty small. <laughs> so, um, you know, you were a great encouragement to me. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, thank God I'm doing a lot better now. Um, uh, the Lord's brought me through it. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of that was, I give you some credit. You know, I'll give credit credits due because, I told myself, well, if, if God can get you through what you went through and help you get through what you went through, to be sure He can, mm -hmm. can get me as yes, well. Amen. And also, I've got a great church to back me up. Yes, I've had amen. men filling in, helping me out on amen. midweek service as well, trying to take a little stress off because ulcerative colitis is mainly causing mm -hmm. stress. But so I like to thank my church as well. Yes, amen. But uh, you know, I'd like to ask you this question. You know, please tell us what it was that helped you keep your song. You know, you're known as the singing preacher. Yes, sir. So what was it that helped you keep your song, keep your joy, keep you going? Okay. Well, you know, um, first off, uh, I, was, I, was, I was a singer, 
long before this all happened. I was raised in a family where music was very important to my family. And my mother, who's now 85, and uh, she's in, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, no, red. Nurse and, and, and Well, yeah, but the end of life care. What's that called? Hospice. Hospice. My, my mother's in hospice now. And uh, but my mother played church piano for 70 years. And uh, she's an incredible piano player. You, you meet anybody that ever knew my mother as a piano player, uh, they'll tell you she was the greatest accompanist that they'd ever sang with or anything. My mother was amazing. So I grew up in this singing family. And I sang my first solo when I was probably three, you know, and I sang all the time with my family and, and whatnot. And so music was a part of my life. And when my children were born, you know, I, I got my kids singing when they were very young. You know, we'd have, we have this little chorus, it's Bible time, it's Bible time, it's Bible time in our house. We're singing and laughing. Let's get the word around. Folks are all excited and we are all delighted. It's Bible time, Bible time, Bible time, Bible time, Bible time in our house. As soon as I started singing that song with my guitar, the kids would come running from all over the house. They couldn't wait to come to Bible time, you know, and we'd sing and have a blast. I'd have the kids act out, you know, Bible stories that they heard in Sunday school or whatever. And we just had a time with it, you know. And uh, so then I got sick. And um, there's so many songs that we sing in our hymnals and things that are just straight out healing balm from heaven, you know. And I would, you know, I've always had a song on my heart, but what happened was... Uh, Years before, I was pastoring uh, in Jackson, California, and, uh, and I had a lady in our church named Grace Southwick, and she was a poet. And uh, I'd, I'd preach sermons, and she'd write poetry about the message that I, that I preached. And uh, one day I was over at her house, and she, she said, uh, Pastor, she said, I, I, wrote, I wrote these words here. Do you think you could put a tune to it? And I said, Grace, I, I'm not a songwriter. She said, well, you wrote a song to your wife when you married her. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's to my wife, you know. <laughs> and she said, oh, I, I'm so sorry. This is just for Jesus. She was always kind of sarcastic because she had a great sense of humor. And I said, okay, whatever. And I, I, went, I went down to the church and sat down at the piano. And I, uh, the, 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 the song that she gave me, if I remember, the, the one that she gave me, if I remember right, was uh, a tune that I recorded years ago called when Moses went to the mountain and commandments were given to him. And uh, I, I wrote that song. I brought it back to her and, and uh, she's, Oh yeah, that's wonderful. And she handed me another one. And uh, that one is one that it's called. He loved even me, the jingle of silver, the glitter of gold. I had betrayed him like Judas of old, you know, and I wrote that tune and I brought it back to her and she, Oh, that's wonderful. And she handed me another one. And, uh, then she had one that she had done most of the work on, but it wasn't, it, it needed help. And it was called the hem of his garment. And then so I changed a few things on there. And then she said, well, why don't you write a song yourself? Everything, the tune, the words and everything. And I said, oh man, you know, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good at lyrics and all that. And, and once again, it was, well, I'm sorry. It was just for Jesus, you know? And so <laughs> I said, whatever. And I, I went and wrote a song called My Dearest Friend. And then I, I sang a song here last night called I'll Plead the Blood. And that was my second song. And then I wrote a song called He's Not Here about the resurrection of Christ. And uh, when I wrote that song, uh, my pastor that ordained me, Dr. Jack Trever, he said to me, you need to quit messing around and start getting serious about writing songs. And um, so I did, you know, and then I got sick. And so I'm laying on my, my bed, flat on my back, but my wife would always have my guitar right by my bed. It was like classical guitar, smaller guitar, because my hands weren't real strong. But, but I could pick it up, and I could, you know, God just started giving me songs, you know. And they came from, and I don't believe in, you know, extra, um, whatever you call it, inspiration and all that stuff. But, you know, God really moved my heart, and God began to give, I believe, give me lyrics and songs. And, and um and by God's grace, you know, I found out about faith music missions in Indiana, and that allowed me to start recording them. And when I started recording them, that motivated me to write more of them, you know, and God just used it all together. And I've been recording now for 30 years. And, um, and I've never been, you know, Fanny Crosby wrote like 3,000 songs, you know, and I've, I've written about 110. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not that kind of a songwriter. I just write songs when um, God just moves my heart, you know, and, uh, 
and it's been such a blessing. I think the, the, the joy of my thing with all the music and the song in my heart was singing with my kids. You know, even when they'd come in and sit around on the bed with me and we'd sing together. And I remember when my, my kids were like, oh, nine years old and down. I was driving down the road with them and one of them started harmonizing. And I literally pulled my truck over to the side <laughs> and said, hey, who did that? And they thought they were in trouble. And uh, I said, no, 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 it was good. And one of my <laughs> boys lifted his hand, Justin, and he was the one that did it. And uh, AJ, my oldest son, he said, we're allowed to do that? Because <laughs> they thought they were just supposed to sing the one note, you know. So they all on their own started harmonizing, and that's really what we do now. My kids aren't note readers. They're harmonizers. We just sing and we harmonize. And, man, we can pick up any song, and all of, all of them just, boom, they got a spot, you know, and off we go. And it's just so much fun to sing for the Lord with your family. And uh, it means something. I've always told my kids, the only reason anybody's ever going to want to listen to you is you have a life to back it up. You ever, you ever uh, walk away from the Lord, nobody's want to hear you sing anymore. You know, and we, we sing right. because of him, not because of us, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's what happened with me. I found personal, I found a personal healing in my heart with a song, you know. Uh, and uh, you did it for therapeutic reasons. Pretty much. There's a number of songs yeah, that I, I sang that song last night, uh, God Wanted It That Way. I wrote that song kind of selfishly for my wife and my family and I. I never wrote it for the whole rest of the world. You know, it was, kids, this is what God has for us in our life. You know, and maybe, you know, we, we, we need to stop acting like God messed up and we need to change things. God wanted it this way, you know. I remember one time we sang, Pastor Trevor had us sing it down there at his church, and my wife, on the way home, she said, you know, I know God wanted it that way, but do we really have to sing about it all the time? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, this is no fun, you know? And uh, it's, it's hard to go through life with a chronic sickness or with someone who has that, you know? And the, and the problem that's been with me through the years is that, you know, I'm, I'm in front of you right now. Praise the Lord, God's been really good. We just never know how it's going to go with me. You know, right. I, I can wake up and be down for a month. You know, it just sure. happens. So we've That's had, why I wanted to make sure we got mm -hmm. you while you were yeah. up. <laughs> we've had to learn. God's been so good to me since I stepped down as a pastor. I haven't missed a single church yet that has invited me to come. God's, God's allowed me to be there at each one and kept me from getting sick all through this COVID. I did have COVID, um, whatever. I had the flu, you know, and I, and, <laughs> and I could have probably ate a raw onion. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you know whatever my immune system took care of it and even in my weakened condition and, and we just went on you know and I've, I've been in numerous churches where people were sick or whatever but we've just kept going and God's been so good to me and I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm rejoicing so I'm, I'm curious have you ever put the Psalms to music have you ever done that uh, I haven't personally done any scripture songs yet I've, I've, I'm seriously going to get to do some of those though I've had yeah, a number of friends great. that have done those yeah, absolutely I love those. Yeah. <laughs> I have some specific verses that, and when, when I do, if I, if I do do that, it's probably not going to be like the average scripture verse w song where you just sing the words exactly as they're on the page. Mm -hmm. I'll probably use that as a chorus or something right. or you know, whatever, but I don't know. Yeah. But I, I love those. Yeah. Those are fantastic. Yeah. Now I was asked not that long ago, what do I believe in my, well, what in my opinion is the most important book next to the Bible, second to the Bible? And I said, oh, that's Louis that's Lamar. Easy. No, I'm just kidding. What's that? <laughs> Louis Lamar. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> I said, that's real easy. The hymn book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, absolutely. you know, and I try to start my day singing yeah. a hymn, but there's been times where I just was struggling so bad, I didn't even feel like singing. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. I would maybe listen to yeah. some music yeah. Yeah. and yeah. then maybe that would. Yes, sir pick my spirits yep, up to yep. where I do feel like singing. Yep. Did you ever find yourself where you just didn't even really feel like singing? Maybe you'd listen to some music. Oh, listen to absolutely. Absolutely. There, like I told you, there's God, when we got saved. Uh, okay. So I think I mentioned this last night in the, in the service music in the Bible has two directions. That's the only directions they have. And, and our music as Christians is to one another in Christ to strengthen, uh, convict, um, preach, motivate, encourage, all of that. And then the other direction is between the Christian and God. It's never between us and the world. And see, my, my father was the one that taught me. He said, you know, if you start writing music for the purpose of, of winning the lost, then you have to use 
set the words to the side over here for a second. And with the music, you have to appeal to their musical desires, and therefore you have to adopt their ungodly music and then try to force Jesus Christ into it in order to reach the law. Well, that was never the purpose of our music. It's just like the church. The purpose of the church was, and when we talk, I mean by the church is when we gather together, you know, and, and whatnot. It's not to reach the lost. Now, lost can come and get saved. Thank God for that. But the church is where we grow in the Lord and we get preached to and we hear difficult truths that the, that the world can't even understand. Right. You know, and, and our music is the same. They don't understand our music. They can't understand our music until they get saved. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Bible says God puts a new song, a new song. in their heart and that, that taste. But I remember hearing, uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, Brother Hicks' testimony, yeah. how he got saved. And the next day, you know, he got in his truck and he put in our ACDC and he's like, good night, what's wrong with this, you know? <laughs> right. And then he takes that out, puts, I think he said he put REO Speedwagon in or something. And then he put in, he said, well, Leonard Skinner's just a good old boy. Certainly, you know, this will be okay. <laughs> he put that in and he's dealing like that. And he was like, what in the world? And his preacher told him, that's the Holy Spirit. You don't like that stuff, you know? Right. But they're trying to cram that stuff down our throat. I got right with the Lord. I got, out, I got away from that music. I turned my back on that music. And all of a sudden I had some of my own siblings and relatives and people that I knew who fell for, you know, the Amy Grant and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden they're trying to tell me that, oh, you can have that music. You just got to put the right words in it. Well, you know, the music, I tell people, uh, you, you can go get this on your own. PBS, public broadcasting stations, systems, whatever. They hired Simon, Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel. They hired him to go all over the world to discover the origins of rock and roll. And there's a whole big thing called the history of rock and roll. And Simon, uh, Paul Simon, he narrates this whole thing and they searched all over the place for it. Guess where they found it? Africa. They found it in some jungle fires in Africa with some witch doctors that he brought mm. onto the stage with him in Johannesburg. And he had some witches over here, some, some witch doctors over here perform their little seance while he did his music over here. And he said to the crowd that he was so excited to discover that his music was spiritual. Well, yeah, it is. Sure. They try the spirits to see whether they're of God and they're right. not of God, you know? So we, we've purposely with our music stayed away from, you know, those worldly sounds because they're they're not of God and if people get hooked on them and then they don't like our kind of music anyways but right. my, my dad if you just told, told me, me 30 years ago that I'd be listening to the Nichols family CDs <laughs> I'd have said whatever right. it is you're smoking let me have some of it baby. I want to buy some of it that new song it's that yeah, new song amen. Yeah. which only the Lord can put there amen. you know and uh, so you can't you can't force a lost person to enjoy our kind of music it, it'll never happen I'm sorry I interrupted you, know, you. We were saying no, something about no, your dad, uh, preacher. No, I don't even remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Right. How would you uh, How would you deal with someone who is saved who struggles with that pull toward that worldly music? What would you well, say to them? To me, it's all cut and dry in the Christian life. You know, if you're having a problem with something that is of God, it's because number one, you're not in your Bible like you mm -hmm. should be. Period. You're, you're certainly not in the King James Bible like you should be because it's a two edged sword. And it cuts the stuff. It cuts you. It cuts all this stuff out of you. But when you're just kind of a nominal Christian, you know, sure, you 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 have a hard time shaking off. You also start doubting your salvation and all the rest of that stuff, you know. But every time I've had people come in like that, and they're they're you know, a few quick questions breaks them down. And you realize they're not living for God. They're, they're but you find somebody that's really serious about the Lord. They want nothing to do with that music. Mm -hmm. They don't have a problem with it because their taste bud is in tune with the Lord and his word. It's, back, it's backslidden Christians or Christians who just haven't grown in the Lord that are struggling with that stuff. And, and that's, I'm telling you, that's true straight across the board all every time. Uh, if you break them down and you can get them honest, sometimes they're not honest with you, but if you can get them honest, their problem is their relationship with the word of God, which is their relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not in the word. And uh, the God of the Bible is very clear in that you know, when you fall in love with his word, you fall in love with him and you want to please him. And there's something that happens just in the spiritual nature of a Christian that's trying to walk with the Lord that changes his taste buds, changes his, you know, his temptations, you know, things aren't just, you know, my dad used to talk about, you know, when he first got saved, he smoked cigarettes. He used to roll them right up here in his, his t-shirt, you know, and, uh, he started growing in the Lord and no one ever told him to stop smoking, but he knew he shouldn't be smoking. And, uh, 
he tells a story about how one night he came to church in his truck and he was getting out to go into church to sit by my mother. And uh, he thought, well, I shouldn't have these cigarettes here in my T-shirt. So he took them out and he put them in his back pocket. And he went into church and he sat, <laughs> sat down after church. He got his truck to head home and reached in his back pocket to pull out a cigarette. And he'd smashed them all to pieces, <laughs> you know. And it was very next day that he went to his pastor and said, man, I'm, I'm, I, just, I, I know I shouldn't quit smoking. You know, I should quit smoking these things. What do I do? And the pastor said, well, where do you keep them at? He said, right here in my sleeve. So the pastor reached into his desk, pulled out a little New Testament. And he said, there you go. New Testament there instead of your cigarettes. And every time you're tempted to smoke, get that Testament out and start reading the Bible and ask God for strength. My dad told me, told me it only took him just a few times when he'd reach for a cigarette. And he said, not only did God help him stop, sm stop smoking, God made the smell and the taste of it putrefying to mm -hmm. him. He didn't want anything to do with it. See, that's the God of the Bible. He can, he can take away your taste buds for that music. I don't care how. I, I got preacher friends that used to be in heavy-duty rock bands, man, <laughs> and they don't want nothing to do with that trash anymore because God just absolutely right. changed their taste buds. You know? I mean, it used to be my life. I, yeah, mean, I yeah. went to Lollapalooza, yeah, all yeah, kind yeah. of concerts, yep. and you know, it was my life. And yep, yep. Taking it's away, absolutely taking away a relationship with the Lord. That's what it boils down to. Amen. Well, see, preacher, see, just on that note, all these new evangelical churches, they don't even have the, the real Bible there. Right. So no wonder they, right. you know, they got all that stuff. You got a corrupt cleanser. Yeah, that's Pastor exactly Peter right. Said you can never get clean on that yep, corrupt yep. cleanser. That's right. Preacher, I've been in uh, fundamental circles now for about 26 years, and it's been alarming to see mm. the amount of kids that just don't turn out for God. Yeah, sure. And just quit. And it seems that children jump and ship and the IFB is of epic proportions. And I just wanted, I, I am encouraged when I see your kids serve Praise the Lord, Lord. Yeah, all amen. four of your kids amen. are in a to God independent Baptist church and yes, all glory be to God. And that is encouraging, but I want to ask you, what do you think, why do you think it is uh, that so many of these children jump ship uh, raised in fundamental Baptist churches and then also uh, what are some of the things that you and your wife did to pass on a love for the Lord and old time religion to your kids? Well, there's a, there's a number of things. I'll, I'll tell you straight out before I even start to answer your question. It's, it's literally the grace of God with my family. Um, I do believe that the trials in our life um, bonded my family together in a special way that without those trials, I'm not sure that bond would have been as deep as it is. Um, we needed each other. And uh, we still do. My youngest daughter, uh, her name is April. She struggles immensely. Um, she's in a wheelchair constantly. She has Lyme's and she has multiple sclerosis. Who is that again? Her name's April. She's my youngest daughter. My youngest? Yeah, she'll be 28 here in about a month. And um, she has two kids. She's had five miscarriages. Um, she's gone through a lot of stuff. And uh, so our family, you know, all of my kids are constantly helping her. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just been something that's been a part of our lives. But, but beyond that, um, yeah, there's a, there's there's numerous things. I I, I will say is I, what I wanted to say as I started is my wife can't my wife and I we're, we're not going to take the credit for it because it all belongs to the Lord. However, it's like anything else, you know. Um, in the in the Bible, God gives directives, uh, principles, and they're like they're they're flawless. You know, if you follow them consistently, um, they do bear fruit. And, and I believe that with all my heart. Um, and I believe that if you follow the plan of God for the Christian home as best you know how, um, it's not going to be the norm for your children to run out and live for the world. I, I don't believe that. It might happen with one of them because, uh, you know, the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And, and my, my father always was careful to point out um, training involves two, two parties, the trainer and the trainee. And if the trainee doesn't want to be trained... Um, he's going to stand before God for that. But uh, I've seen some kids come out of really good families and not live for the Lord, you know. But um, having said all of that, um, I believe it's very, very important to practice in your home what you say you believe. Um, I know people that will shout amen at church and go home and have a different life. Um, preachers preaching against things on the television or something, and then they'll go home and have, you know, a big bookshelf full of R-rated movies. 
you know, for the, for the family to watch or whatever, you know, and that does not work well. Um, you, you have to be who you say you are, your kids. If there's anybody on the face of the earth that knows your flaws, it's your children. So you have to be consistent. Unfanged. Uh, that's right. Unfanged. You know, like I remember when Jesus saw Nathaniel, he said, uh, uh, there, there is an Israelite and there is in whom there is no guile. You know, he was just, he was real, you know, so you, you got to be real. Um, the other, the other, several other things that I've told people before is that, um, you know, uh, you got to teach your kids what the right things are, but you, you have to let them grow in the Lord, in their personal walk with the Lord. I never got in my children's face and said, you know, did you read your Bible? Uh, no, I forgot. Oh, what, what is wrong with you? You know, get in there right now and read that Bible. We never did that. It was more a conversation on why, why don't you want to read your Bible? You know, what's going on? You know, um, more of a spiritual matter than a just, you know, do's and don'ts. You will do this. Check the box here that you did it. Um, there's 80% of young people leaving homes now that are church, church family homes of all, all brands that are leaving home at 18 and never going to church again, you know? And, uh, part of that, another reason, I think I talked to you about this earlier when we were just talking about things ourselves, um, yesterday at, at dinner, I think it was, we, we just made sure that church was fun, you know, serving God was fun. It's not like we had to go soul winning. We wanted to go soul winning. It was, this is the greatest thing ever. Too. My kids, every time I'd get in the vehicle to head down to church, they'd be like, Dad, where are you going? Well, I'm going down to church. Well, can, can I come? What's going on down there? You know, they, they had this. We always had something fun going on at church. You know, there was some big uh, push for attendance or some, you know, some fun contest or something. I mean, we, there was always something going on. It was always fun. It was never like, ah, oh, we got to go to church again. It was in my family from the time we we started having kids and before my wife and I were always excited about church, you know, and church was a fun place. And we were, we were blessed to be in a church that wasn't a bunch of people fighting each other and slashing each other's backs and, you know, just all that. We had a, a very happy, you know, and I, and I, I believe in churches. If you keep, if you keep the focused on what we're supposed to be focused on reaching the lost, mm -hmm. serving the Lord, instead of just sitting around looking at each other over the week and trying to find some flaw, you know, like, oh, look at that dress she wore or whatever. You know, w women especially, and I'm not against women, folks. I, you know, I, my mother was great. I married one. I got two <laughs> daughters, you know, so I'm not against women. But women can very easily start noticing each other. And, you know, my mother, my wife taught me years ago that women, by and large, don't dress for men. They dress for women. You know, like, look at this, look at that. And doesn't that fit me nice and all that? And they don't even realize how dangerous they can be. Um, but then they also start noticing, oh my goodness, can you believe she wore that? Can you believe? And they start, if, if, they, if you don't get women focused on serving Christ, they will rip each other to shreds, you know? And then you have all sorts of fights, you know, in your church and a nonsensical stuff. Read your Bible. Uh, stuff happens continually through backslidden women, you know, and it becomes a danger. And that's why it's very important. It's men the same, but it's very important to keep focused on what we're here for is keeping people out of hell. And when you do that and people are getting saved in church, it's exciting, man. New believers, people growing in the Lord, having their lives changed. It's just, that's an exciting church. You know, that's a fun church to be a part of. And so my kids were always like excited because they had visitors there. We had them on the bus routes. Um, I had families that would say, you know, we just don't want our kids around those bus kids because, you know, they might say a bad word. Well, what we did with our kids is say, we let them know in advance. You're probably going to hear some kids say some bad words, but we don't say those words. And those kids don't have parents that teach them not to do. That's why we have the best ministry. We're trying to lead them to Christ so Christ can change their lives and so forth. And that's just, isn't that part about being a Christian, you know? And Amen. so from the very beginning, we just taught our kids that serving Christ was not like a millstone around our neck. It was. We don't got to, we get no, to. we don't got to, we get to. Yeah. And, 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 and my kids to, still to this day, that's how they're raising my grandkids. And I got 13 of them with two more on the way, you know, and it, it's just so cool. And uh, I really believe that we just never sat around and talked about how, I never talked about like how this preacher was mad at this preacher and, you know, or how people in the church might be upset at each other. We, we never had that conversation around our children. My wife and I did not get in the car with my kids in the back seat. And sit there and have you know refried pastors and and refried church members. You know we 
they didn't, we, we didn't talk like that in front of them. As far as they knew, there was no trouble in our church. It was just great. Everybody loved each other. We were all serving God together, you know. Now, as my, as my boys especially started getting older, and when I say older, I mean 12, 13, um, circumstances would happen. Like, that kid turned 18 and told his dad, it's my life, I'm not coming to church anymore. Well, I'd sit my boys down and I'd say, you see that kid? You see that decision he made? Let's watch how that goes. Now, boys, it may take three or four years, but let's just watch that, and I'll talk to you again later about it. So then I'd watch them, you know, and then my kids would watch them. And I used circumstances like that, and then they'd, one day I'd say, how do you think that decision went? Oh, man, Dad, look at this. Look at this. And they'd see, the, you know, the disaster of that decision. I could sit down with my boys when they were 13-year-old boys, 12 and 13, and I could say, so-and-so, you think he's a faithful man or an unfaithful Christian or a nominal, nominal or faithful? <coughs> they could pick every man in that church out to the, to the T of what, what kind of a man they were. You can't fool kids. But I taught, my, I taught my, my boys to be leaders, to have wisdom, to look at, look at situations with a biblical principle in mind of how to make a decision in that, in that circumstance. What, what biblical passage of scripture or thought, whether from Proverbs or wherever, that would guide you how to make a decision? Because you know what? If we make that decision today on June 24, 2022, and we say, well, that's wrong. Well, guess what? If we live to 2030, it's still going to be wrong. You know, it's not going to change. So too many Christians are constantly revisiting decisions. You take the question you asked me. I have these, you know, I've had these people through the years and they think that it's okay to go to an independent fundamental Baptist church that's taken a certain stand and then go home and in their home, listen to contemporary Christian music. And then they wonder why their kids don't stick around an independent fundamental Baptist church. That's the number one reason that they're losing their children is because of music. Music's the number one hook that the devil uses to pull children out of our circles. It's the number one. Because, let's, let's face it, it appeals to the flesh. Sure. And if they're weak spiritually, it's a, it's a hook, line, a sinker, game over. You know? and, uh, and, and, and so music, that's one of the reasons why my, my wife and I and my children are passionate about um, producing the right kind of music because it's, there's a desperate need for it. And, 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 and unfortunately, many of these people, the only, the only resource they constantly turn to is to turn on their radio to some local, quote unquote, small C Balaamite bookstore <laughs> radio station, you know, and hear complete garbage mm -hmm. and listen to that in their car with their kids on their way to your church or my church, right. you know? And then they wonder why their kids just get confused as to what a fundamental Baptist is or what a Bible believing Christian really is supposed to be. Well, you can't do that kind of stuff. And, and, and so it doesn't really boil down to the, oh, Pastor Nichols and his wife, you know, they were genius parents. No. <laughs> more, more than once I had to apologize to my kids because they heard me arguing with their mother or whatever. You know, and I'd say, I'm sorry. I think sorry. that's important to be able you to know, do that. Your apologize mo Your to mother your kids. started it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, what was the name of that that music ministry that you Faith Music Missions? Do they have like a website yes, that has music? Yes, yeah, and things? Faith Music Missions. You can look it up real easy, and you could also go to nicholsfamilymusic dot com. That's where that's where you want to get our music. Faith and Music Ministries Missions Missions Faith Music Missions. Now that ministry, what's beautiful about it is that it's run by a local church. It's not a, it's not just some recording studio out there making money. They're run. It used to be Bakey Road Baptist Church. It's now Faithway Baptist Church. Um, same church. They just bought a new building, and they used to be on Bakey Road. And so now they're on a, another street, and so they changed the name to Faithway, which goes great with Faith Music Missions. So they got all kinds of stuff there, good music. Right. Amen. Well, that's pretty much it for me, preacher. I Did I answer all your questions? Yes, sir. Or, I mean, I could talk to you all day, yeah. but we got a— <laughs> Long-winded. Yes, sir. Sorry. Do you have any more questions for, the, for the fundamental Rush Limbaugh over here? <laughs> no. yeah. the gold EIB network. Behind no. the golden EIB microphone. No, I think we're good. Well, <laughs> certainly an honor. Preacher, you we thank you for your time. Man, thank you so much. We'll be, we'll be praying your health holds up so you can come Amen. back next Amen. year. Amen. Amen. Yes, All right, sir. thank you, Preacher. Look forward to it. Thanks, guys.